Hi there viewers, I'm a medieval reenactor and living historian with a professional background of about 20 years in um, the textile industry, uh, including uh, about six years working exclusively as a hand sewer. <laughs> um, so I'm here today uh, to share with you my knowledge of uh, medieval hand sewing. This video is intended for people who are beginning sewers who are interested to learn about medieval sewing techniques and who may not have done a lot of hand sewing before. As a textile and clothing industry worker and also a fashion historian, I believe that the construction and making of medieval garments was extremely clever and uh, often virtuosic. However, the process can be broken down into uh, simple parts. Here I will be showing you the running stitch on a medieval style woolen broadcloth and I'll be using a medieval style woolen yarn followed by a linen thread which was also used in the medieval period. Okay, let's get started. Firstly, I'm going to demonstrate how I like to thread a needle. I'm using a fairly large modern needle and a piece of woolen yarn that is a two-ply weaving yarn I purchased secondhand. It's similar to what can be achieved with hand spinning techniques. I'll be using this thread because it's a fairly good representation of the kind of thread that may have been used on medieval garments, especially of the lower and middle classes. But also I'm using this thread because it presents a challenge to threading. My piece of thread used in this video is probably longer than would be comfortable for a beginner. Longer thread is more prone to tangling as you sew. A good length of thread to begin with might be about as long as your arm once it is threaded. So for this example, you would want it to be as long as your arm and then perhaps half to two thirds as long again. The extra thread is folded back on itself and I refer to this as the tail. I'm just trimming the end of the thread with a sharp scissor these are similar to a medieval style scissors and this trimming action gives a nice blunt edge to the end of the thread that makes it easier to pass through the eye of the needle. Now I'm simply squeezing the freshly cut end of the thread between my thumb and forefinger to flatten it, meanwhile easing the eye of the needle onto it. I squeeze the thread again in the same way to pull it out through the other side of the eye of the needle. If it is a bit difficult, you can twist the yarn and wiggle the needle to help move the thread through. If need be, start again by trimming the thread once more. I'll be making a seam with only a single thread today, not double, so I'll leave the main sewing thread long and the tail as half to two thirds as long as that, as I said before. Here is my sampling fabric with which I'll be demonstrating how to sew what is possibly the most useful and basic stitch, especially in medieval sewing, the running stitch. I'll be stitching down the long edge of this piece of cloth, which is very similar to a late medieval woolen broad, broad cloth. It's important to make sure that you place the right sides of your cloth together when you make the seam. In other words, the sides of the cloth that would be seen on the outside of the finished garment. I'll begin by showing you how to knot off securely. This is how I like to do it. There are historical examples of knotting off that differ from this, such as the method used in Opus Anglicanum or in other extant textile finds. However, this is a nice easy way that I find is unobtrusive and quick and holds well. If you have a favoured method or can offer any historical methods, please feel free to comment below. It's also good to pin your work before you begin. The general method is to pin this at the start and end points of your seam so they match up before placing the pins periodically along the seam so that the edges line up neatly. I'm using a couple of homemade brass pins today that I use for reenactment. Now to knot off. Pass the needle through the work from the front to back, positioning it carefully. You want to think about the distance away from the cut edge of the fabric and keep that consistent throughout sewing the seam. Medieval seam allowances were generally not very wide, from memory around 6 to 9 millimeters or less. Unlike today, 
which are around 6 to 15 millimeters or even 20 millimeters in some instances. If you're confident, immediately pass the needle through the work again to the front as I did here and pull the thread through almost to the end. You can see me managing the excessive length of thread in the video by pulling gently back on the tail to straighten it before continuing. Pass the needle through the work again over the top of the previous stitch. This should lock it in place. If not, you can repeat this step to make sure. You can just see me doing that now. I tend to be a little overcautious when I'm knotting off. This comes from years of working in the industry where I would always get my work back if it wasn't right. So yeah, this is how I tend to do it. The next videos that I'll be doing in the future will include backstitch, which is another important stitch in medieval sewing. I'll also be showing you how to fell seams in two ways. I'll be showing you how to fell them open and also closed. And those methods of felling a seam lend themselves to being used with the back stitch and the running stitch respectively. Now you are ready to sew. I'm removing the first pin because now this end of the seam is secured. Pass the needle from the front to the back and from the back to the front of the work just like when you knot it off. You can pull the thread at this point or if you're feeling confident you can pass the needle back through the work and make a second stitch. Check the tension of your thread once it has been pulled through by gently tensioning the length of the seam as I'm showing you. Then continue to sew. Check the length of each stitch as you make it. You want them to be consistent and not too big. You will learn how to do this by eye fairly quickly, so you won't need to measure. Medieval stitching varied in length, but could be 2 to 5 millimeters each. Your stitch length may be dictated by factors such as what kind of fabric you're sewing, what thread you're using, and how much strain the seam will be under. Running stitch was commonly used in the Middle Ages to make long seams in garments, especially when those seams weren't under a lot of strain. A variant on running stitch is modernly called stab stitch, and this is used to finish a neckline on a 14th century example of a neckline binding, and may have been used to finish the top seams of hose, along with many other applications. To finish, I knot off again. I do it in a slightly different method, making a tiny loop of thread on the surface of the fabric, then passing the needle through the fabric before threading it through the loop. Then I tighten the loop by pulling on the needle as shown. You might repeat that to make sure the thread is nice and secure. Unfortunately, I pulled too hard <laughs> on my thread, snapping it, but the knot should be secure enough. So that's it, a simple and versatile running stitch on a medieval wool broadcloth using a woolen thread. Remember to trim your ends for a nice looking professional finish. And there you have it. This seam is now ready for felling by hand. A seam made with a running stitch lends itself to being felled closed. In other words, both seam allowances are laid to one side. This method of felling makes the seam stronger, perfect for a running stitch. I'm going to sew a running stitch on the same woolen broadcloth, this time with a linen thread to show you the comparison between the linen thread and the woolen thread. I've chosen thread colours that contrast with the fabric for ease of demonstration, but you might choose to use a thread that has a matching colour to your fabric. Depending on your impression and what you're rep representing in your costume, you may wish to research deeply into the kind of threads appropriate to the garment you're sewing. In a very general sense, wool, linen and silk threads are appropriate for medieval garments. There is also evidence to support the use of cotton. 
In this example, I'll be knotting off differently by tying a knot in the thread before I pass the needle through the fabric as shown. Pinning the work as before, find your starting point and pass the needle through the work. Make a stitch as before and ensure that your knot is caught on the fabric. If not, begin again with a bigger knot. Make a stitch on top of the knot before you begin sewing. Notice I removed the first pin before sewing as before. Working the linen thread is very similar to working the running stitch with the woolen thread. Uh, there's nothing really to add here. Um, it's just probably going to pass through the woolen broadcloth more easily due to the smoothness of the thread in comparison to the woolen yarn. And I'll just show you the two samples of running stitch side by side. You can see that the linen, the linen thread allows you to make small stitches. There's no reason why you can't make small stitches with the woolen thread. I just find that it's easier to do so with the linen thread on the needle. I believe it's because the linen thread is finer. And there you have it, that's a short tutorial on the very basics of making a running stitch on a medieval style woolen broadcloth. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, stay tuned for more short tutorials about basic medieval stitching. Um, please feel free to give us a like uh, and a subscribe. I'd love to hear your comments and suggestions if you'd like to share them. Um, anyone who is a keen medieval sewer or textile enthusiast, um, love to hear any comments, feedback, especially um, always keen to talk textiles with other textile people. <laughs> Thank you so much.